I think this is the. I think. Do we do we get deep into this? Right here. Right here. Okay. So this last little bit in our notes uh, is about relating uh, cellular respiration and how we study that in animals. And so bioenergetics <laughs> energetics is the overall flow and transformation of energy in an animal. So that's what's going on with cellular respiration is really an energy transformation. So <laughs> we look at and we can determine how much an food an animal needs, calories, how much energy, and how that relates to how big the organism is, its size, how active it is, and how the environment can play a role. So what we do in studying the roles of size and the environment and activity is um, we can quantify energy use by figuring out the metabolic rate. The metabolic rate is the amount of energy an animal uses in a unit of time. So metabolic rate can be determined by the, an animal's heat loss, the amount of oxygen consumed, or carbon dioxide produced. So basically the metabolic rate, and we're going to be doing this in our lab, um, so this is going to relate directly to our lab. We're going to figure out the rate of cellular respiration. So if we think here, when it says metabolic rate can be determined, how do we measure the rate of cellular respiration? So that first bullet says that we can measure the amount of heat loss because heat, heat loss is um, happens during cellular respiration. Or we can look at the gas exchange. We can measure how much oxygen is take, being taken in by the organism or how much CO2 is being exhaled or um, released from the organism. So like for instance, the more oxygen the organism takes in, that's an indication that there's more cellular respiration happening and therefore a higher rate. So, <coughs> so metabolic rate is proportional to body mass to the power of three quarters. So M is the mass. So, there, so mass affects the metabolic rate. It's proportional. So we have two graphs here. Let's look at this first graph. Let's look at what it's showing you here. It says, uh, down here, it says relationship of basal metabolic rate or BMR to body size for various animals. Let me talk about the basal metabolic rate. So the metabolic rate is how much, carb, uh, how much cellular respiration is happening. Basal metabolic rate is just the bare minimum that you need to be able to stay alive, all right? So you're not very active, so they're very, um, uh, so like for instance, like the basal metabolic rate would be like if you were just getting up in the morning. So you're just laying there, you just get up, you've been sedentary and so on throughout the night. That's your basal metabolic rate. So look at, uh, so here's your mass. So this is in kilograms. So um, the mass is getting higher as we go up here. And then um, the y-axis is the BMR, the metabolic rate. And how is it measured? In liters of oxygen per hour. So that's why the rate, the rate is per time period. So they chose hour here. So what they're doing here is they're measuring how many liters of oxygen did the organism take in in an hour and so their per hour rate and compared them. So what we see here is they have a bunch of different animals on here and we have a linear graph here where we have the organisms that have the higher overall body mass and over here the organisms with the overall lower body mass. And what happens to the basal metabolic rate? The organisms that have the higher body mass have a higher rate. They're taking in more liters of oxygen. Why? Because they're way more, they're, they're just bigger, they have more cells, and so therefore they have to take in more oxygen to, um, to have cellular respiration occur in all of those cells. So we have a relationship between body mass and metabolic rate. This graph is showing you something different. What has changed and what they're looking at here? So now, notice here B, it says relationship of BMR per kilogram of body mass to body size. So we're still looking, so the body mass here, the elephant still is, has more body mass total than the shrew or the mouse. 
uh, and so on. So that part's the same, but what we're comparing is the basal metabolic rate. We're still looking at liters of oxygen per hour, but we're looking at per kilogram too. So what does this mean? If you took a kilogram of elephant tissue, and you took a kilogram of shrew tissue, and you compared that same mass, right, the, uh, uh, kilogram to kilogram, look at what happens. The metabolic rate in the elephant is way smaller than in the shrew. So, so <clears throat> what that means is that smaller animals, gram for gram, have a really high metabolic rate compared to larger animals. But overall, if we just look at the overall size, elephants would have a higher metabolic rate because they just have more grams, all right? They're made of more um, material, all right? And so, but gram for gram, in this case, kilogram for kilogram, the smaller animals have a much higher metabolic rate. And so, let's write here, larger animals have more body mass and therefore require more chemical energy. So that's like in graph A. Smaller animals have higher metabolic rates per gram than larger animals. And we can put in parentheses here, that's graph B, what the graph B is showing you. The key here is per gram. That's the key word here. Higher metabolic rates per gram than larger animals. That's graph B. The higher metabolic rate of smaller animals leads to a higher oxygen delivery rate, a higher breathing rate, heart rate, greater blood volume compared with the larger animal. So to give you an example, each gram of a mouse, for instance, requires about 20 times as many calories or as much energy as a gram of elephant tissue. Even though the whole elephant itself uses far more calories than the whole mouse, gram per gram. And so, so if smaller animals do cellular respiration, have a higher rate, um, and do this faster per time period, then they need oxygen at a higher rate. And so that's why here, how do we get oxygen to your cells? You breathe it in, and then from the lungs, the oxygen goes into your bloodstream, and the bloodstream carries the oxygen to your cells. So if a small animal has a high metabolic rate in the cells, then they have to have a high oxygen delivery rate. So therefore, two things go into play with that, your breathing rate, so they take in more oxygen, their breathing rate increases, is higher, and their heart rate is, increases. Why does the heart rate increase? Because the heart pumps, it's a muscle that pumps that blood through the body, and so it's how, so to get that blood, to get the oxygen to the cells, that heart has to beat at a faster rate to get that higher oxygen delivery rate. So smaller animals will, will have that heart, uh, higher beats per minute if you feel a small animal. And so small animals, if you have like pets and stuff, their heart goes a lot quicker than ours do, all right? And this is the reason why, all right? Because they do a higher rate of cellular respiration gram per gram, all right? And so to round everything though, animals harvest chem chemical energy from food. Energy containing molecules from food are usually used to make ATP which powers cellular work. After the needs of staying alive are met, any remaining food molecules can be used in biosynthesis. Biosynthesis includes body growth, repair, and synthesis of storage materials such as fat. So we use everything that we need for energy and anything left over we can use to grow and reproduce um, cells. Um, so growing is repair damaged things. <laughs> so we have this picture here. So this picture, I'm gonna um, draw on it. So this pulls it all together um, of what happens when things go into our body. So <coughs> or get this, this box here, this rectangle, is supposed to be the living organism. So this is like the body. And so you have organic molecules and food coming in. What do we do with those molecules? We digest them first. And then absorption. What does absorption mean? Absorption means the molecules go into your bloodstream and then your blood takes them to all the cells in your body, so your body cells. That's what absorption is. So when we eat like um, starch, let's say, we digest starch into glucose. The glucose then leaves our digestive system in our small intestine and it gets absorbed into the blood. 
So then the glucose then goes to our body cells. So notice here, this arrow, these arrows coming off here, digestion um, releases heat. So, so that's increasing the entropy of the universe um, by digesting our food. Then notice here, this arrow coming off here, energy lost in feces. Not everything that we eat is actually going to be used by our body. Um, and so some things pass right through us and those things will leave in our solid waste or our feces. What was the molecule in um, plants that we don't digest that will leave? Fiber. Fiber, which is cellulose, right? So, so an example is cellulose. We don't have the right enzymes to digest the bonds that hold the cellulose together. And so that just passes right through us and we call that in layman's terms fiber. All right, so that's our energy loss in feces. So all the other things will get to our body cells. And so our body cells will use those molecules for a couple of different purposes. There, um, it will use it for cellular respiration. So, so cellular respiration, remember, is making ATP, and that's a very exergonic process, which will increase the entropy by letting off heat. So that's this up here, letting heat off. All right, <coughs> and we make ATP. Um, the second thing, arrow coming over here, is these molecules that are in our body cells can not only be used for cellular respiration, but we can use them for biosynthesis. What does that mean? Growth, we just wrote that, growth, repair. And so, so we can use those as biosynthesis, and that's why you have an arrow coming back here, because it can be made to, used to make more body cells. Um, that's the growing process, and that releases heat as well. Um, then coming off of here, our body cells are living, living things, they produce waste, and some of that waste from the chemical reactions in the cell says energy lost in nitrogenous waste, and so this is, this nitrogenous waste is getting rid of um, in our urine. So, so this is cellular waste from different reactions and things like that that we've used from our um, food molecules and so <laughs> so that's what that means and so um, this is the importance of our kidneys our kidneys built so this this waste will go into our bloodstream and our kidneys filter our blood and get all this waste out so that's why we have to have our kidneys um, and so to filter that out uh, and then lastly then at the end here uh, cellular respiration produces ATP ATP can be used to drive the biosynthesis, so growth and repair, and do cellular work. When we use ATP, remember we break it down into ADP and a phosphate, that's what happens, and that's an exergonic process which releases heat, which increases that energy. Okay. So that just kind of pulls it all together as far as what we use the organic molecules we take in for, all right? Okay, so <coughs> what we're gonna do Next is apply some of this and talk a little bit about the lab that we're going to be doing um, and looking at over the next couple days. So we said that animals, larger animals have more body mass and so therefore looking at this graph, as body mass increases, um, the uh, metabolic rate increases. And then this one was for gram for gram, uh, if uh, a, you know a gram of something with a higher kilogram in this case of a high the elephant has a higher overall mass but if we take a kilogram of it compared to kilogram of the shrew the smaller animal um, gram for gram has a higher metabolic rate what we're going to do is do test this to see if the same thing holds true for plants all right so we're going to look at plants because all of this is with animals so in larger animals and smaller animals and so on um, we know this to be true. Um, we're going to see if the same concept holds true for plants. All right, and we're not going to actually use actual plants. We're going to use seeds. All right, and so and I'll talk a minute about why that is. So what I want you to do is take a look at the stapled handout that you picked up here today. And I want you to read the first page front and back, please.
let's go over um, a couple of things. So, so in this lab, the living organisms that we're going to measure the rate of, I said we're going to see if that same kind of idea holds true with um, plants as they do with animals. And so, um, do you see, we're going to look at, do you see it's with a higher mass, have a higher metabolic rate? Because we find that with animals, the higher the mass, like the elephant, has a higher metabolic rate because it's bigger. All right, so we're going to see if that holds true for um, seeds as well. And then the second question um, is, is the metabolic rate per gram of tissue lower in a seed with greater overall mass? That second graph we learned with animals is that gram for gram, the animal that has the greater overall mass, like the elephant, if we look at gram for gram, they have a lower metabolic rate than, than um, a gram of uh, a mouse. And so we want to see if that also is true for seeds. All right. And so uh, and the seeds that we're going to use, I have, and that you're going to design your own lab tomorrow. So you can choose, you may not use all of these different types of seeds. I have corn seeds, but I have some soaking in water right now. Um, I have mung beans, it's just a type of bean. And I have barley seeds as well. And so, um, so those are the, the organisms that we're using, and we're going to measure the rate of cellular respiration and see if these things are true. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what a seed is. Um, can you tell me what's inside of a seed? What's inside of a seed? A seed is inside of a seed? It is. It, a couple of people said that it's a it's a baby plant, and that's exactly right. All right, but it's interesting when I ask this question. It, a lot of people don't know what's inside of a seed, and so a seed actually has a little baby plant, and so um, that baby plant's like a little embryo um, for the plant, and that plant was formed on um, that seed. Uh, the baby plant was formed by an egg and a sperm cell. All right, and so plants also the egg has to be fertilized by a sperm cell, then they become one a one cell baby, which is called a zygote, and then it divides and makes an embryo. So let me just give you an example of um, of that. So something that you may be familiar with, like um, an apple. Apple seeds are in the middle of the apple, right? And so uh, is there just one seed usually? Yeah, in apples, there are multiple ones. And so let me show you, just give you a brief overview of what happens uh, in the, in the flower. All right, bear with me with my drawings. All right, so this is, this is a flower, the flower part. So you have a, the middle part of the flower. All right, and this part right here, so petals, all right. So, so, this is your flower. Uh, so this is a flower. All right. This is why I label all my diagrams because we can't tell what they are. <laughs> I draw them, but they're a flower. And this is the center of the flower. And then you have these um, uh, parts that stick out around the center of the flower. The flower, the middle part, is the female part of the flower, and these guys here are the male parts of the flower. So now what happens is down here, this part right here at the base is called the ovary of the flower. All right, so this is the ovary, and inside of the ovary, you have these little kind of cubby holes that are called ovules, and these ovules contain the egg. So the eggs are in the ovary in these, um, and so there are multiple eggs. So there's not just one, there's lots of eggs inside of the ovary. All right, so then this, these parts that stick up around the female part, those parts are the male parts of the flower and they have pollen, all right? So pollen is kind of, you can, if you touch that part of the flower, it's kind of like dusty, all right? It's powdery um, and so on. But what the flower, uh, the pollen is, is it contains the sperm. All right, so what happens is, is the pollen, if it gets on the top of the female part of the plant, pollen has a sperm, the, the pollen will grow what's called a pollen tube. It's an actual tunnel down the, the female part to, that leads to the egg. And so guess what? The sperm 
goes down this pollen tube and moves down the pollen tube and eventually reaches the egg and it fertilizes it. And then, so now you have a one cell little baby apple tree. This is an apple blossom, all right? And so then that cell starts to divide and you get a little baby embryo. And guess what? This ovule here hardens and this becomes a seed. So then another pollen can grow another pollen tube and fertilize this egg and this becomes a seed containing a plant. Another pollen can fertilize this egg, and this becomes a seed containing a baby plant, and so on and so forth. So you, that's why you have multiple seeds in an apple, because what happens is, now the fertilization has taken place, and flowers are unique in that they can, this is called self-fertilization, if the pollen from the same plant fertilizes the egg, but they also can cross-pollinate if a pollen from another flower came here. Um, and so then what happens is the flower dies off and guess what happens to the ovary? The ovary grows into the apple. So therefore the, an the apple that you eat is actually the ovary of the apple blossom. All right. And so that's what you're actually eating. Put a whole different spin on eating an apple. All right. Um, so then, so what you can do, each one of those seeds, yeah, so you can gross somebody out when they're eating an apple at lunch. Go, no, you're eating the apple, the ovary. Oh, <laughs> All right. Because awesome. that's what you're doing. So, <laughs> so in the center there, that's why you have multiple seeds. It just depends on how many pollen fertilize the, the eggs, and therefore you can have different amounts of seeds in every apple. All right, it just is random how much fertilization took place. Yeah, absolutely. So in the wild, the deer will go eat the apple. Um, the, the seed has a hard, hard seed coat, so the deer eats the apple, it goes right through their digestive system. They now go somewhere else and excrete it out in their feces, and now the apple, the seed, comes out and actually can grow. Alright, from there. Um, Even more wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, let's talk about the seed. So the seed, if I were to take one of these seeds and we would enlarge it here, it has the baby plant in it. And so what happens is the seed also in it, surrounding the seed, it's not just empty space. Um, the, the seed around it has starch. Starch is chains of what? Glucose. And what you can use glucose for energy, right? So this is an energy source for the plant. So in a seed, in, oh, and then on the outside, as I said before, is a hard seed coat. So seeds that we, where's my bag of seeds here? Seeds that we buy in the store, they're hard and they're in, and, and so on. And so um, when you buy seeds, is the baby plant inside of here alive? How many people think yes? How many people think no? All right, so we're gonna have a split here. All right. The baby plant inside of here actually is alive, all right? But it's just doing the bare minimum. So it's doing a little bit of cellular respiration to stay alive, but it's not very active. It's not growing or doing anything. So therefore it is like, we call it dormant. It's in a dormant stage right now, which means it's alive, but it's not doing much and doing just enough to stay alive, all right? And to get just enough energy to, to stay alive. So what happens is when we plant seeds is we need to activate them. We need to get them out of that dormant stage. So how do we get a seed out of dormant, uh, the dormant stage? What am I doing with them over here? I put them in some water, all right? I'm not gonna keep them in water forever. I just put them in water for about maybe five or six hours. The um, water starts to absorb. Um, it starts to take up more volume. Um, I, um, I germinated some yesterday and when I um, germinated them overnight, and so it looks like this, the mung beads, when I came in this morning, they were all the way to the top. So what happened is they absorbed all of that water that was in there, all right? And so, so their volume kind of increased because of that. And so the second thing that they need is, and this is why they're inside, is warmer temperatures will stimulate, all right? And so that's why we don't plant, um, you know, until it gets warmer out um, outside. And so warmer temperatures will stimulate it, stimulate it. So that's, that's um, our temperature in here will do that. Okay, so then what happens is when it gets enough water, the seed coat softens. And then the, it starts absorbing water, and the warmth and the water stimulate to grow. Um, what part is going to crack out of the seed first, um, the root or the stem? 
it's actually the root. All right, let me talk about why that is. All right, so the root takes in water. So this is the water source. And <coughs> this plant, is it doing photosynthesis? No. So where is it getting energy to grow? This is the purpose of this right here. All right, the starch in it, um, which um, is in um, uh, glucose, it's a nutrient source like glucose, can be used for energy for the plant to grow. So what happens is this guy, the root comes up first so it can get a water source, and then um, it has, so it has water and it has energy and the nutrients in the seed, and that's gonna be the energy to eventually break out and begin to grow and so it'll grow out of that and so the seed will break away um, and so what happens is where do we usually plant seeds under the ground right so what happens underneath the ground is the seed the water uh, the root comes out first to absorb water then this part comes out here so it's not getting sunlight because it's underneath the ground so it can't do photosynthesis yet hence the purpose for the nutrients in the seed so it continues to grow using the nutrients in the seed until eventually it um, breaks ground where now it can absorb sunlight and begin doing photosynthesis and making its own food so the nutrients in the seed is just so that it has enough energy to get to the to the um, top of the soil to do photosynthesis that's why if you read on the back of um, packages of seeds it'll tell you the depth in which to plant the seed if you plant a seed too deep it can grow and grow and grow it might run out of energy before it ever reaches the ground and then you'll go why did my seed come up all right and that's because it can, it ran out of food in the seed and it didn't reach the the soil for uh, top of the soil in enough time and so it'll eventually die that way all right and so that's what a seed is so we're going to use seeds to um, measure the rate of cellular respiration to do these two questions um, and so how are we going to do that so let's look at what we call a respirometer so cellular respiration is i'm just going to write this up here c6h12o6 plus six o2s gives you six co2s plus six waters plus energy all right so this is our cellular respiration equation. So in our notes, we said that you can measure, to measure the rate of cellular respiration, the amount of energy released, you can measure the amount of CO2 released, or you can measure the amount of oxygen taken in. Anybody catch what we're gonna do in the lab? Which one are we gonna measure? Amount of O2 taken in, amount of CO2 released, or the amount of energy released? Yeah, we're doing the amount of O2 taken in. So we're gonna measure how much oxygen these seeds are taking in for cellular respiration. So how are we gonna do that? We're gonna use what's called a respirometer. A respirometer is gonna look like this, all right? This is, this is a respirometer, let me explain here. So you have a glass tube, it's weighted on the bottom with a washer that I glued to it. It has a pipette here. The pipette from the tip to the last line measures one milliliter, and it has increments in point 0.1, so you can measure um, uh, volume with it. I, it has epoxy glue here so that when the, uh, the pipette went through the hole in the um, pipette, that are the hole in the stopper that nothing can get through here and seep through here. And so therefore, when you put this on tightly, the only um, exchange from inside of here to the environment is through this tip. All right, and that's your respirometer. So let's look at how we're gonna use this to measure cellular respiration. So I'm gonna draw a little respirometer here. So, so here's your respirometer. What you're gonna do is you're gonna put at the bottom some absorbent cotton. And this is just regular old cotton, all right? We call it absorbent though, because regular cotton, like a cotton ball, it'll, it'll absorb water, all right? And so therefore, it's absorbent. And what we're gonna put into it is a chemical called potassium hydroxide, or KOH. So we're gonna um, uh, put some drops of KOH in the cotton ball. And then we're going, we don't want the KOH to touch our seeds. So therefore we're gonna get a barrier. But what we want to do is we don't want a barrier that doesn't allow gas exchange. So we're gonna use a special kind of cotton called non-absorbent cotton. It's treated with a hydrophobic chemical. So therefore it doesn't absorb um, 
water or any water-based products, all right? And so that's a non-absorbent cut. So what we're using here is the KOH isn't gonna get absorbed into there, which means then it's not gonna touch the seeds. But what can get through the cotton, the non-absorbent cotton, is gas. There's still pores and things like that, so you can have gas exchange occur in there. And then on top of here, we're gonna put our seeds. So then we have our seeds. So this is your respirometer. So then we close it off and, and have our pipette in there like this, okay? And so that's your setup of your respirometer. So now we have our seeds in there. So how are we gonna measure how much oxygen this, these seeds are taking in if they're doing cellular respiration using this pipette? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna immerse the pipette or the respirometer in a water bath. So what we're gonna do is, here's water. We're gonna have a tray of water. These are the, what? Is that coming from next door, that noise? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. I think she's on the phone with us, this is speaker phone. Um, uh, so, it's our conference hour. This, uh, these trays here on the sinks are the trays that you're gonna use. So I'm gonna fill, we're gonna fill those up with water and have them filled up. And then you can actually put your respirometers in here. So here's the respirometer, all right? And here you have your two layers, you have your seeds in here, and you have your pipette sticking out here. All right, so there's your pipette. So you lay it in there. What's gonna happen to the water when you put this in here? Where's it gonna go? It's gonna go into the pipette, right? It's gonna go all the way to the seeds. No, why? Yeah, there's gas in here. There's oxygen, there's carbon dioxide, there's nitrogen, so there's gas in here. So the, the air pressure in here, um, when the uh, eventually that water will stop, wherever the pressure inside is equal to the pressure on the outside. Does that make sense? All right. And so, so we have um, uh, air, a volume of air in there. All right. So usually you have to let this set for a couple minutes because when you first put them in, the water is sloshing around a little bit. And so on. So we got to let it sit for a couple minutes, let the water settle and let this kind of um, uh, equilibrate um, into a, and, and stop moving around due to the movement of the water. All right, so it eventually will stop at a certain location. And so, so then if we're gonna um, measure cellular respiration. So how are we gonna do that? So let me enlarge a seed. So here's one of your seeds in there. And this would be happening for each one of your seeds. If the seed is doing cellular respiration, gas is, gas is gonna be exchanged between the seed and the environment around it. So what is the seed gonna be taking in from this chamber? It's gonna take in oxygen, and what's it gonna give off? CO2. It's gonna give off CO2. So this gas exchange is occurring, and notice the ratio in our in cellular respiration. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. Same amount of O2 going in is the same amount of carbon dioxide going out for cellular respiration. So therefore, if cellular respiration is going on, for every one oxygen going in, one CO2 will go out. Um, but what's gonna happen though, is remember, and here comes the point of putting that chemical KOH in this, in that first layer. That chemical KOH, when you read the, the um, lab, what does it react with? Reacts with CO2. So what happens is when these guys seeds are doing cellular respiration, they're going to take in oxygen, but when they release CO2, that CO2 is going to react with the KOH and forms a white solid. So what happens is when cellular respiration is occurring, oxygen is going to be taken in, but it's not going to be replaced. This gas is not going to be replaced by a CO2 molecule because the CO2 is going to react with KOH and become a solid. So what's going to happen to the number of gas molecules in our chamber here? It's going to go down. If the number of gas molecules go down, what's going to happen to the water? The water is going to go in, all right? And so then the water goes in here. And so let's say it goes in, and, and remember this is a pipette that has measurements on there. So let me give you an example. Let's say it started out as this line here was 
This was point, it read 0.9 milliliters. That's a point. Nine milliliters, and let's say we let it go for a minute, all right? And we measured it for a minute, and after a minute, this is where the line was. And let's say that this read 0.85 milliliters. So in that minute, how many milliliters of oxygen did our seed take in? Yeah, 0.9 minus 0.85 milliliters. Um, and so we get 0 0.05 milliliters of oxygen consumed in a one minute time period. And this is a rate, all right? How much oxygen consumed per minute, all right? Per time period. And so what we can do is um, we can run this and, and for maybe 20 minutes and take a measurement every one minute and see, and we can get the rate over time um, of the um, milliliters of oxygen consumed um, per minute. And really then this rate is telling you, because the more oxygen consumed, the more cellular respiration takes place, all right? And so that's how we're going to use this to, um, this uh, apparatus to, um, ex uh, to figure out the rate of cellular respiration. All right, and to compare um, rates between um, your setups. All right, so um, if you look at back to your um, diet or the um, the packet, the second page. I want you to just look at the top of the second page there, um, where it says getting started. Second page meaning the, the third page, the third second literal page. Um, and look at the top where it says getting started and number one. I have a blast from the past from chemistry here. We have an ideal gas law here. All right, so I'm going to go look, preview that real quick. Mm. <laughs> Do you remember PV equals NRT? Mm So, PV equals NRT. Um, so it tells you what everything is. Um, R is always the gas constant. That's going to be the same. Um, and so, so <coughs> um, let me go through a couple of scenarios applying this here. So, number one, let's say, looking at this equation here, if we increase the pressure at, at a constant temperature, so we keep it at a constant temperature, what must happen to the volume? So we keep the temperature constant, so the R is constant, temperature is constant. We increase the pressure. What has to happen to the volume? It, the volume would have to decrease. If this side is gonna remain equal to this side, all right? And if we keep these guys constant, then the volume, if you increase the pressure, in order to keep this the same, you'd have to decrease the volume. All right, let's apply another one. We increase the temperature and keep the volume constant. So the volume is constant, R is always constant. We increase the temperature. What must happen to the pressure? We need this to be equal. So increase a number on this side to keep it equal on this side. If this one's equal, this, something's got to increase on this side, right? So pressure would increase. And that makes sense. Let's talk about this. If you have gas in a container and you increase the temperature, what happens to kinetic energy? Start moving around more, what's going to create more pressure, all right, um, on the sides and so on. And then lastly, PV equals NRT. And now we keep pressure and temperature constant, but we increase the number of moles of gas. I mean, R is always constant. So what must happen to V? 
the volume would increase and that makes sense um, if we add more molecules into here and keep the pressure constant we'd have to increase the amount of space so the pressure stays the same so let's talk about so that's a quick little review about PV equals NR2 and I want to talk about how it relates to our lab so how does this relate so PV equals NRT so R is constant in our lab what we're gonna try and do is think about the concept what's happening to n in our lab if cellular respiration is hit going on it's decreasing right because it's taking in oxygen and we're not replacing it with co2 so in our lab n is decreasing which means that what's happening to the volume in the gas here this is also decreasing which is causing this to move in here so the volume goes down all right and so um, what we're going to try and control for is, um, and uh, we're going to try and control the temperature um, as well. So we want the N and the V, we want the, this change to be occurring as a result of, um, we want the movement of water going in to be a result of um, the number of gases, uh, gas molecules going down, not because the temperature is changing. So we're going to control the temperature. How we're going to try and control the temperature is um, tomorrow, we're going to do the lab on Thursday. Tomorrow I'm going to run tap water in these bins and let it sit overnight. So therefore, overnight will be at room temperature. It should not be, our room doesn't fluctuate temperature very much, and so it should be stabilized. Um, and so if we control temperature, we're also kind of controlling the pressure as well um, as a result of that in terms of the, the pressure is not going to change as a result of the temperature increasing um, or decreasing. We're also going to try and control um, pressure um, with using a control because the other type of pressure that we need to control for is air temp pressure. So there is atmospheric pressure um, from the atmosphere being put on everything on the earth. So on us, on the table, and also on our water bath here. And the atmospheric pressure is not constant. It changes. It can fluctuate. You've probably seen this in weather reports where they'll say, they sometimes they'll call it the barometric pressure.